Ghazali clearly held very strong theological beliefs and used his very prominent uh, argumentative skills to argue for these opinions. His life could be seen as a constant search for knowledge, true knowledge of the truth, which was inseparable from knowledge of God. All of his intellectual endeavors was aimed at reaching knowledge, and he says this himself. Quote, the thirst for grasping the real meaning of things was indeed my habit and wont from my early years and in the prime of my life. It was an instinctive, natural disposition placed in my makeup by God Most High, not something due to my own choosing and contriving. But he also tells us in his autobiography that sometime while he was working in Baghdad, he had a intellectual or spiritual crisis, one of several in his life. And this period of skepticism began when he realized that we can't really trust our senses. To Al-Ghazali, there were two kinds of knowledge. There was knowledge that we gained from sense perception, so anything that I see or hear or taste or touch, that is a direct kind of knowledge that I have. And secondly, there was rational knowledge, intellectual knowledge, you know, say conceptual knowledge. So this is knowledge that we can deduce from intellectual activity. But Al-Ghazali realized that when it comes to the senses, they aren't really all that trustworthy. For example, quote, the strongest of the senses is the sense of sight. Now, this looks at a shadow and sees it standing still and motionless and judges that motion must be denied. Then, due to experience and observation, an hour later it knows that the shadow is moving and that it did not move in a sudden spurt, but so gradually and imperceptibly that it was never completely at rest. Sight also looks at a star and sees it as something small, the size of a dinar. Then geometrical proofs demonstrate that it surpasses the Earth in size. In the case of this and similar instances of sense data, the sense judge makes its judgments, but the reason judge refutes it and repeatedly gives it the lie in an incontrovertible fashion. So he asks, if we can't trust our sight, which is to him the strongest sense, what can we trust? So this then naturally also extended to that other kind of knowledge that Ghazali uh, lists, which is reason. If we can't trust our senses, then can we really trust reason? And he comes to the conclusion that no, reason too is in fact fallible. Quote, While everything you believe through sensation or intellection in your waking state may be true in relation to that state, what assurance have you that you may not suddenly experience a state which would have the same relation to your waking state as the latter has to your dreaming, and your waking state would be dreaming in relation to that new and further state? If you found yourself in such a state, you would be sure that all your rational beliefs were unsubstantial fancies. And this launched Al-Ghazali into a huge personal and spiritual crisis. He becomes skeptical of everything, even though he is outwardly pious and, and still practices his religion, inwardly he is unsure of everything. He can't know if anything is true. Similar to Descartes, Al-Ghazali questioned all assumptions. He was unsure if he could know anything at all. Quote, this malady was mysterious and it lasted for nearly two months. During that time I was a skeptic in fact, but not in utterance and doctrine. At length, God Most High cured me of that sickness. My soul regained its health and equilibrium, and once again I accepted the self-evident data of reason and relied on them with safety and certainty. But that was not achieved by constructing a proof or putting together an argument. On the contrary, it was the effect of a light which God Most High cast into my breast, and that light is the key to most knowledge. But this was only the first of his several personal crises. Um, after working a number of years in Baghdad and being an enormously successful man, something happened again. In 1095, he had another major spiritual and existential crisis. This was spurred by him realizing that all of his intellectual endeavors, his whole career, had been based on selfish desires. He did not seek knowledge or, or have this high teaching position for the sake of knowledge itself or for the sake of God perhaps, but instead as he admits himself it was to gain fame and reputation, so it was an egotistical uh, reason behind it.
His whole motivation for writing all those works, all those debates, was worldly success. And this sent him into an even greater spiritual abyss, and he fell greatly ill, both mentally and physically, being basically unable to teach anymore. He also appears to have been questioning the purely rational and doctrinal approaches to religion that he had dedicated his life to at, up to this point. He says himself that, quote, Next, I attentively considered my circumstances, and I saw that I was immersed in attachments which had encompassed me from all sides. I also considered my activities, the best of them being public and private instruction, and that in them I was applying myself to sciences unimportant and useless in this pilgrimage to the hereafter. Then I reflected on my intention in my public teaching, and I saw that it was not directed purely to God, but rather was instigated and motivated by the quest for fame and widespread prestige. So I became certain that I was on the brink of a crumbling bank and already on the verge of falling into the fire, unless I set about mending my ways. His brother Ahmed al-Ghazali, who we talked about in the beginning, had taken a slightly different path in life than his older brother. He had become a Sufi, a ascetic dervish, who would later on become one of the most famous uh, Sufi poets in the Persian language of all time. Al-Ghazali the Elder was of course aware of his younger brother and the Sufis generally, and at this time in his life it seems that he decided that he wanted to take a new approach to reaching true knowledge, one not through books or arguments, debates or intellectual conceptual knowledge, but rather through the direct experience and tasting vauk, of the Sufi mystics. He left some money and made arrangements for his family to be taken care of, but gave away the rest of the money to charity. He told his superiors that he was simply going on a pilgrimage to Mecca and had his brother take his place as teacher in his absence. But he wasn't just going on a pilgrimage, he was going on a long journey, both inwardly and outwardly, to discover true knowledge through mysticism. He left basically everything behind, including his family, and wandered. Uh, it appears that he stayed in Damascus for a while, closing himself off in the uh, um, famous Umayyad Mosque. Uh, it also appears that he did go on a pilgrimage to Mecca for a while, but after this we know basically nothing about what he did or where he was. For 11 years he was gone. He wandered around the Islamic world, uh, probably meditating, praying, and doing other spiritual practices. And after those 11 years, he was a changed man. It is this turning point, this experience, that makes Al-Ghazali Al-Ghazali. It is the pivotal turning point in his life that makes him such an interesting and inspirational character. He returned to the world as a fully dedicated Sufi, who had affirmed that the experiences that all the previous mystics had talked about were indeed true. He had reached true knowledge through direct experience of the truth. For some reason, he then returned to his family in the year 1106. He resumed his teaching position and eventually moved back to his native region of Tours in Persia where he later also died in the year 1111, a very easy date to remember. Al-Ghazali had spent his life in search of knowledge and found it in Sufism. But that doesn't mean that he gave up all his intellectual activity. He indeed continued to write and, and many different works of, of, of theology, for example, and he still appears to have very strongly adhered to the Ashari school of Kalam for the rest of his life, even if he was also very critical of the kind of speculative rationalist approach to God by the end of his life. In fact, it was during his 11 years of living in seclusion that he authored his most famous and important work, and one of the most significant and influential books in intellectual history, the Ihya Ulum ad din or The Revival of the Religious Sciences. The importance of this work cannot be overstated. Some claim that it is the most widely read Islamic book after the Quran and the Hadith literature, and it came to have a significant impact on the future trajectory of Muslim intellectual thought in general. It's a massive, monumental work. The book is a kind of summary of the principles and practices of Islam generally, and a kind of guide for people on how to live a reflective, pious, and spiritual life. 
It is divided into four sections that deals with the essentials of faith, social customs, as well as how to live a properly spiritual life. The last two sections of the book are on the spiritual and mystical aspects and in a way functions as the kind of goal of all religious devotion. The book kind of leads the reader on a path to the higher stages of mystical life. So while the book is obviously quite broad in its scope, Al-Ghazali shows his clear devotion to Sufism in particular by dedicating so much of this work to it. Indeed, one of the significant things that this book did was that it attempted to synthesize Islamic theological doctrine and kalam with the practices and ideas of Sufism in general, presenting a more easily accessible form of Sufism which was, according to its audiences, more firmly grounded in accepted doctrine. As a result, Al-Ghazali and the Ihya al umuddin is often seen as being responsible for the wider acceptance of Sufism generally in the Islamic world and of the incredible flourishing of Sufism in the later Middle Ages. While I would be careful about attributing all of this to him, there are of course many other factors that played into this development, Al-Ghazali is still obviously an incredibly influential and maybe one of the most influential thinkers in the history and development of Sufism in general. And indeed he is greatly remembered, not just in the Islamic world, but in the West and other parts of the world as well. 